good morning to those in New Zealand and good afternoon to everyone here in the US and in Canada. I'm Leanne Wynn broadcasting live from New York and I am here with Sharks for Kids and partnered with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants all this week to bring together women in shark science. So today we have our second Google Hangout and it's Britt Finucci, who is talking to us, just graduated actually with PhD this past uh, December, multiplied or rather worked on multiple different shark related projects and has some really cool new position and uh, projects that she's working on in New Zealand with some deep water fisheries. So go ahead and take it away. All right. Can everybody hear me? Hope so. Um, all right. Uh, thank you, Lynn, and thank you up this morning. Um, I do have a presentation, so I'm going to just try and link that. So give me a second. On the left-hand side, you'll see the green little chalkboard. There you go. Awesome. And you can share your screen. All right, so that's all good to go then, Lynn? Yep. Okay, cool. All right, so as Leanne said, um, I have been working on some deep sea sharks, which no matter what anybody says, these are the coolest sharks out there. Uh, just a little bit about me. I heard there was one classroom from Ontario, which is fantastic because that's actually where I am from. I was born in London, Ontario. Um, which, as some of you may know, is nowhere near water. So as a kid, um, I played with lots of different animals, uh, but no sharks at the time. Um, now, when I finished my undergrad, I got a little uh, tired of being cold all the time and only being able to play with some fake fish. Um, so I decided to move all the way down to New Zealand, which is pretty much the bottom of the world. Uh, but this is where I did my master's degree. Um, in marine conservation, and then I was fortunate enough to get a PhD position. Um, and this is where I was really introduced to the whole world of deep sea sharks. Um, as Leanna said, I have worked um, with heaps of different species. Oh, We're live. Like <laughs> We're live <laughs> Sorry there. Um, yep, so I've worked with heaps of different species, and as you'll notice, they don't look like your typical sharks. Um, you know, those, these are not your great white sharks. Uh, most sharks are quite small, um, and they look kind of like, a lot of people say they look like monsters, but to be honest, they're not at all monsters. They're actually really cool, and they've got some very unique adaptations to the deep sea. Um, but the best thing that, well, for me personally, that I like about deep sea sharks is that they're data deficient for most of them. And this means we don't know much about them. There's a lack of information. Uh, so we don't know where they live. Um, we need to know, we don't know where they eat, how long they live, how big they grow, um, how many pups they have. We still don't even know how many species there are. Uh, there are about 500 species of deep sea sharks. And when I say that, I also that also includes um, rays and chimeras, which I'll talk a little bit about later on. Uh, but we are describing new species of deep sea sharks all the time, which is really, really cool. Now, some of these sharks do include um, some of the smallest sharks out there. Um, this is the spine pygmy shark. As you can see, it gets to only the size of a pencil. Um, so you can fit these in your hand. Um, the deep sea also includes some of the largest sharks in the ocean, um, like the Pacific sleeper shark. Uh, now this shark, they say, can grow up to nearly seven meters long. Um, for those that use the imperial system, that's about 21 feet. So that's a really, really big shark. And these guys live really, really deep in the ocean. Um, some deep sea sharks are very ancient too, um, like the frilled shark too here. You might have heard of that one before. Um, and then what's really cool about some species is that essentially they glow in the dark. 
Um, this is a velvet belly, sorry, a velvet belly lantern shark. Um, and at the top here, or sorry, at the bottom here is what the shark looks like. And then the top image here is what the shark looks like when it's glowing in the dark. And this is called bioluminescence. Um, and this shark in particular, it glows around its spines. Um, so this shark has two spines, um, one in front of each of its dorsal fins. Um, so that's why they were calling this shark was given the nickname of having a, sh um, a, li a lightsaber um, because its spine started glowing in the dark. Um, some sharks as well, um, they can give electric shock. So this is the deep sea electric ray. Uh, the species is also essentially blind, uh, which is really cool. It's just a little guy um, about the size of a ruler. Um, this shot here is what it actually looks at um, underneath. So it's a really funny looking shark sits on the bottom of the ocean. Uh, this is a species we get around New Zealand um, and you don't want to touch them. Uh, when they're still alive, um, they can give some pretty nasty shocks. Uh, most deep sea sharks as well, they have a unique specialization where their eyes glow in the dark. Um, so you can see that here, they get this light shine. It's, it's the same kind of light shine um, you see when you shine a light near your pet's, uh, when your cat's eyes in the dark. Same sort of thing, but we get it in deep sea sharks like the gulper shark here and a long nose chimera. Um, so it's really cool. So they can glow in green. I've seen uh, eyes that glow more of like an orange color. Um, and these are different adaptations they use um, to living in a very dark environment. And then of course the deep sea sharks include some of the rarest sharks. Um, White-tailed dogfish um, around New Zealand. We've only ever seen uh, maybe four or five of them. Um, don't know why, don't know where they are, you just don't see them. Um, so they're really, really cool. And it's a very rare and unique thing when you do find one. Uh, now, one question everybody always asks me is, what's my favorite deep sea shark? Um, and of course, that is the prickly dogfish. Um, you might have heard of that one before. I have talked about it. I do talk about it online. Uh, it is quite a funny looking character here. Um, and uh, some people refer to it as a seal, I guess maybe because of its big eyes. Uh, but we call it a prickly dogfish because it has very, it is very prickly. It has very prickly skin. Um, now shark skin um, is called, um, they have what are called denticles. Um, and in prickly dogfish especially, they're in raised. So, um, so you can kind of see here um, around the spherical, they're actually, they're quite large and they're very, very sharp. Um, so it actually makes handling a prickly dogfish very difficult, um, but totally worth it because they're totally cool little creatures. Um, this is a young male here. Uh, they don't get very, very big, um, just a little bit over the size of your ruler. So about 50, 60 centimeters generally. Um, they have tiny little fins and they can get big, big bellies. Um, and they look kind of funny and I can only imagine what they look like when they're swimming around because they can't move very fast with such small fins and such a big pot belly. Um, and another funny thing about them too is that they've actually got very, very small mouths. So if you were to take your picky finger, uh, you could that's about the size of a prickly dogfish mouth. So it's not very big. And I have a video here. So there's five different species of prickly dogfish. Uh, this is a species that's found um, in the Mediterranean. Uh, they were actually able to keep one in captivity. So it's a really cool video because it's one of the few videos we have of one of these species alive. So as you can see, they're a very, very slow moving species. They kind of hover around the bottom. Um, but what's really re unique about prickly dogfish is that they have a very specialized diet in, in which they like to eat eggs, um, generally eggs of other sharks, so rays and chimeras. And it appears what they do is they go around the bottom and, you know, when they find an egg case, like you see here, they um, 
they'll latch on and then they'll suck up all the yolk. So if you like scrambled eggs and you have something in common with prickly dogfish. And there you go. So I ate everything inside the yolk and off he goes. All right, now the other group of sharks that I work on are really, really cool. I'm going to show you a quick video first as well. Um, teachers, Nautilus Live is great. They're always doing explorations in the deep sea. You can always check it out. It's uh, live footage. Now keep your eye out in the distance, guys. All right, so I'll leave that one at that. Um, but the other group of sharks that I work on are called chimeras. Um, you might have not heard of them. Uh, they tend to be the forgotten sharks when you include shark sprays and chimeras. <coughs> um, they are also called ghost sharks, uh, spook fish, rabbit fish, and rat fish. So they do have a bunch of different names depending on what part of the world you're in. Um, and there is about 50 species that we know of so far, and most of them are found in the deep ocean. And then they're called rabbit fish, rat fish, um, partly because of their teeth. Um, so as you can see, what we have here on the right is a typical shark jaw. So you've got rows and rows of shark teeth. Um, but in chimeras, they have very different teeth. They actually have tooth plates, um, so as you can see here. So they're, um, they're like rabbit teeth, or rat teeth, rodent teeth, essentially. Um, they, um, yeah, so they don't have the rows of teeth like sharks do. And they're, I wouldn't say they're as sharp. They're so, no, you don't, you don't want to poke your finger in their, their mouths, but they're not. Um, they're, very, they're quite different from, um, from regular sharks. And they use their, those kind of teeth uh, to feed on creatures that live in uh, the sediment at the bottom of the ocean. Um, so they're usually crunchy things like uh, crabs. And this is a uh, chimera from New Zealand that was filmed. Um, presumably it's just, uh, it was found something in the sediment it wanted to eat, face planted in the sand and grabbed whatever little crunchy bit was down there. Now, chimeras, there are three different groups of chimeras, and they're placed in their group based on uh, the shape of their snout. So the first group of chimeras are called the plow-nose chimeras. Um, they're uh, regularly known as elephant fish, at least in New Zealand, Australia. Uh, you do find them um, in my part of the world, um, as well as in South Africa and around South America. Uh, so there's three species. Um, you get um, a lot of recreational fishers uh, that will fish these guys because they are quite shallow and uh, they, apparently they taste quite good. I've never tasted one, um, but a lot of people do eat uh, plow-nose chimeras. Uh, they make great fish and chips. The second group of chimeras are called short-nose chimeras. So as you can see, their snouts are quite different from the elephant fish. Um, and uh, these are one of the, the, the numerous groups. This is a numerous group of um, chimeras. Uh, there's 20 or so species. Uh, actually, it's probably close to 30 now. Uh, they are found all over the world. Um, in New Zealand and Australia, we have one called the black ghost shark, uh, which is really beautiful. Um, they're, uh, they're normally um, all black and they've got like purplish fins um, and then the big green glowing eyes. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, just really, really pretty species. Um, one species that uh, you guys in North America might be familiar with uh, is called the spotted ratfish. Um, and this is one of the only chimeras that, um, that are kept in captivity. Um, so next time you go to an aquarium, take a look. There might be some chimeras um, in that aquarium. Um, I know the Toronto Aquarium has ratfish. Um, where else? I've seen them in the Georgia Aquarium as well. Um, so they are quite easy to keep in captivity and um, they are there, but I think a lot of people tend to overlook them. So keep an eye out and 
may be able to see some real chimeras um, up close and personal, which is really cool because again, these are a deep sea species and you know, not many people get to see live animals. And the last group of chimeras uh, are the long-nosed chimeras, which is pretty self-explanatory. You can see that this is a Pacific swordfish and it's got a very, very long nose. Um, when uh, these guys are just little babies, that long nose uh, can measure up to 50% of their body length. So that's huge. Um, and they use these snouts, uh, I think anyway, to, um, to look for um, food. So they've got uh, sensory pores all down that long snout. Uh, and I think they, again, they just kind of hover near the bottom uh, and detect uh, potentially electrical currents from their prey. And that's how they would, um, that's how they find their food and then that's how they feed. But again, there's, there's so much we need to know or learn about the deep sea animals. And unfortunately, it's, it's very difficult to actually study them in their natural environment. Um, let's just let some work. Oh, yeah, so one more. So the Okeanos Explorer, that's another great um, series to, to keep an eye out. They do... Um, uh, ex explorations in the deep sea all the time and you watch footage live. Uh, they do occasionally catch long-nosed chimeras like this one here um, on film. Uh, that's fantastic. It's also hilarious to listen to the commentary sometimes. Um, but as you might have noticed with the, um, the videos I've shown is that um, chimeras also have very big pectoral fins. So these are the fins that are moving up and down. Um, in some countries, um, chimeras are also referred to as butterfly fish, just in the way they move, it kind of reminds um, people of butterflies. So they're quite graceful to watch, I think, anyway. But really, really cool species. Um, and the low-nose chimeras are some of the deepest dwelling sharks that we know of too. So this guy can get up to, I think it's about two, uh, two kilometers deep. Um, I'm sorry, I can't, I don't know that the equivalent of miles right now, but um, it's pretty, pretty far down in the ocean. Um, okay, there we go. There's my equivalent. Sorry, I'm still waking up. I did put this together. I do know what I'm talking about. Um, but just to show you where chimeras generally sit in the oceans, so you have me way up at the top here at the surface. Um, you have chimeras, which generally sit um, between 1,000 and 2,000 meters. So I guess that's about 6,600 feet. Um, so these are quite deep, um, which also means that there is no diving with these animals, um, at least with these long-lost chimeras. They live too far down in the ocean for me uh, to be able to go diving with them. So the next big question that I always get is, well, where do you get your sharks from? How do you see your sharks? Uh, and the answer, most of my sharks come from research surveys, like this one here. So this is the RV Tangaroa. Uh, this is New Zealand's uh, research vessel that goes out to sea. Uh, it's capable of going all the way down to Antarctica, um, and it goes all around the Pacific um, on various uh, research expeditions. Uh, but it's mainly hired out uh, to do fisheries research. Um, now, I was really fortunate when I first started my PhD to go out on the Tangaroa for a month. Um, if anyone does get into fishery science and they do get the opportunity to go out to sea, by all means, go for it. It's a really, really um, unique opportunity uh, to not see land for 30 days straight. Um, and the things you see out there are just unbelievable. Uh, you do have to put up with some things like living in a tiny little bunk bed, um, which has a, um, an extra side propped up, um, which you can see on the top bunk. And that prevents you from falling out of the bed um, when the boat's rocking back and forth. You'll also see that the water uh, in taps, for example, tends to come out sideways, uh, which makes having a shower quite difficult because you tend to uh, chase the water back and forth in the bathtub because um, the, the boat, if the boat's constantly moving, so is the water. Um, I've got one more video here and um, 
this is just what it looks like. This is a, this is a bad storm actually. Um, so usually, you know, you've got beautiful weather, there's birds everywhere, uh, sun shining. Um, but this is uh, from a survey a couple of years ago and Tiger got stuck in a big storm. Uh, massive waves everywhere, everything's really wet. Uh, you gotta stay inside and move up and down with the boat. Um, but it's sometimes what it looks like at the middle of the ocean there. Right. And unfortunately, what I found out is that I get very seasick. Um, so my trip, we actually had uh, that bad kind of weather for most of the time. Um, so I was very acquainted with uh, the floor and with the bathrooms. Um, but um, like I mentioned, it's totally worth it. Totally go out to sea because this is where you can see so many cool things. This is where I found, this is where I get my samples of deep sea sharks. Um, so we had, um, whatever I have here on the left, we've got spiny dogfish, uh, we had lots of little pups, so we'd collect them, if we captured them, we collected them, put them back out to sea, because, you know, we want to make sure that we can, um, you know, we don't want to waste anything, we want those guys to have the best chance of surviving, so put them back out to sea, uh, we've got bumper sharks, and of course we've got a little prickly dogfish in my hand there, um, and that is from my knowledge, the smallest prickly dog fish record we have for New Zealand. So I was very, very excited when we found that one. Um, we got so many, many shark species out here. These are some lantern sharks that are found around New Zealand. Uh, these are the type of sharks that glow in the dark. Um, beautiful colors. Um, they get purplish and blue, or sorry, purplish and green um, in their, on their skin. And I know they look quite dark. Um, in the images, but up close, they're just stunning creatures to look at. Um, also get a lot of different um, skates and rays. Um, so on the left, you've got one of the more common skates around New Zealand, and that guy probably um, was at least a meter long. So big, big skates, um, as well as the little blue skate here, which again, probably just fits in the palm of your hand. Um, so, like I mentioned, um, on the Tangara is where we do a lot of fisheries research. Um, this is the lab itself. Um, some of the scientists are on board. Um, and the science that you do have to see, really, it involves measuring a lot of different fish. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fish. Um, after a while, the guys kind of go into a to kind of like a robotic stage and they just, uh, they know exactly what they can do. They can probably do it with their eyes closed. Um, and they're taking these measurements um, and biological samples from fish. And this is how we measure um, our fish stocks and ensure that what we are catching, the, the quotas for fishing, um, for fish stocks are sustainable so we can continue to fish them into the future. Um, so they go out uh, mainly to look at very um, commercially important species uh, like orange ruffy. Uh, New Zealand has a very big orange ruffy fishery, uh, which is this orange colored fish you see here. Um, a lot of what we do too is identifying uh, species to the species level. So you've got some days they take, um, they catch a lot of tiny little fish that all look exactly the same. So people get, you know, all gathered together and are trying to pick out the different species. Um, to me, they all looked exactly the same, so I wasn't any help there. Um, but then another very important part of the biological sampling they do are collecting uh, what are called otoliths. And that's the, uh, the image, those white bits, um, and the image in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, now, otoliths are ear bones in fish, um, and these are used to age fish. Um, so as fish grow, it's the same kind of concept as a tree with the tree rings. Um, you count the rings to determine how big or how, uh, I'm sorry, how old a tree is. Same thing with fish. So as fish grow, they deposit rings around these otoliths. So you can um, examine an otolith under a microscope and count the number of rings to determine how old fish are. And of course, there's all sorts of weird and crazy creatures that are found on these surveys. Um, we've got fang tooth, um, the purple, that grumpy purple fish. 
Uh, it's called a toadfish. It's, um, it's actually a relative of a blobfish. I'm sure most people have heard of that one. Um, lots of different squids um, and really ferocious looking creatures. Um, but fun fact is that most of these fish are actually very, very small. Um, that fang tooth in the top left hand corner, that's, um, that's less than the size of your, um, your hand. So you can fit a whole bunch of those in your hand. So they look ferocious, but they're tiny, tiny little creatures. Um, and then, of course, it's not all work. You get some play as well. Uh, my friend studies squids. Uh, so when she was out there, we were looking for giant squid. We didn't find one, um, but uh, the, the guys on the boat ended up drawing a big one on deck for her and called her up one day and said they found a giant squid. So she was quite happy about that. So yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. Um, yeah, if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to take them now or if you wanna contact me later, quite easy to find online. Um, more than happy to, to talk about uh, deep sea and deep sea sharks all the time. Awesome, so thank you so much, Britt, for sharing lots of that information. So at this time, we lost a few classes because it's nearing the end of the school day, but um, we can take some questions. So let's see, we can go ahead and start off with um, Mr. Stelton. If you, we have fifth graders from Ontario, so if you have a few questions, go ahead and bring them on up. I can't unmute. Yes, sir. Yeah, there you go. Oh. All right, before Jack. Have you ever seen a great white shark? Have I ever seen a great white shark? Yes, I have. Um, not in New Zealand, um, but we do get them here, very big ones. Apparently, they get up to like four to five meters here, um, which I guess is, oh, what is that, about 20 feet? Um, but I did see them when I was in South Africa. Uh, South Africa is a very um commonplace to find great whites so yes i have seen them there thank you awesome Britt. if you don't mind unsharing your screen so that way we can see you instead of all of us moving around awesome and then go ahead we'll take another question from the same class one more <laughs> Go on then. He's muted. I can hear you. Go ahead. Mr. Stel Mr. Stel Stelton, if you want to unmute, we can take another question from your class. Oh. How many species of have you come across? Oh, good question. A lot. You know what? I keep meaning to make a list. Um, but I, I couldn't tell you actually right now. I work with a lot of museum specimens as well. Um, so if we were to include those species, um, oh geez, I, I honestly couldn't tell you a lot. I've seen, I've seen quite a few, not as many alive, but I have seen quite a few working with museum specimens too. Um, so yeah, I'll have to get back to you with that one. May we ask you a question? Yes, of course. When, when did you see your first shark and where did you see it? Talk louder. The first shark that I ever saw in the wild, uh, it would have been, how old am I now? It would have been about 12 years ago. No, more than that. 14, 14 years ago, um, I was in Mexico, and it was a whale shark, actually, which is the biggest shark out there. Um, the whale sharks migrate um, to Mexico in the summertime, um, where you can see big, big numbers of them, and they uh, think of it, believe anyway, that they feed at the surface. Um, so that's a great place to go find a whale shark. 
if you ever want to see them. I have a question. Okay, thank you. Ask for another question. Awesome. We have we another actually have, We have one that's been sent in, and they ask, how, how deep does the shark have to be to be considered a deep water shark? Good question. So deep water sharks, uh, the general rule is that they spend most of their lifetime or their life cycle at depths greater than 200 meters. Uh, so that's that's general standard of what people use. Uh, it can vary a bit by country depending on how deep a country's water is. Um, but yeah, that's, that's normally the go-to, 200 meters or more. Awesome. We have one, um, Ms. Castell's class, they're having some technical difficulties, but they sent in a question that said, Allison from New Jersey wants to know if there are any sharks that can be pets. Can be pets? At the top, on the top of my head, none that I know of. Um, so there are many species of sharks that are kept in aquariums. Um, but I don't know of anyone that keeps sharks for pets. Um, I think they'd require a lot of work, a lot more than your standard dog. Um, so it'd be quite hard to keep one as a pet. All right. Can you ask another question? Sure. Misha? What is the most dangerous shark or fish animal that you have encountered? Well, if you want to go by the, the statistics, uh, the great white shark would be the most dangerous. Personally, um, the chimeras that I work on, I've been stabbed by chimeras so many times. I, I, I couldn't tell you. The chimeras, I don't know if you noticed, they have a really, really pointy, sharp spine um, on the top of their backs, and they use that as a defensive mechanism. Um, it's also a little bit um, poisonous. Um, and the amount of times I go to pick a, up a chimera and, you know, this, that, they use that spine and they get stabbed in the hand. Like, I would consider them the most dangerous ones because they're the ones that actually get me. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's totally my fault. I'm handling an animal. Um, by all means, they're allowed to defend themselves. Thank you. Great question so far. We can go ahead and take more from your class. And Ms. Castell, if your class has any others, go ahead and feel free to send them in on the chat and I'll go ahead and ask them. Okay. I think we're working. One more question, if that's all right. And then we're going to have to dip out. Sure. Okay. Oh, Kayla. Mm -hmm. Go, Kayla. <coughs> Um, Big loud voice. Have you encountered any sharks that can breathe on the water, mm -hmm. on top of the water? Any sharks that can breathe outside of the water? Was that the question? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Um, there is one type of shark. It's called an epaulet shark. Um, and that one's known to be able, so they don't live entirely outside of water. Um, but they are able to essentially hold their breath for some time. So they live in very shallow water. And if their water um, dries up, they're able to kind of walk on land into a new body of water. Um, well, I wish I had video. There are some videos online. It's really, really cool. Um, but that's one shark they can kind of breathe out of water. Not breathe out of water, but live temporarily out of water. Okay. Thank you. One last question and then we have to go. Have you seen any hammerhead sharks? One. I've seen one baby hammerhead shark. Uh, we were out fishing for bright whites actually. Um, and this little tiny hammerhead came by. It was probably on the, you know, on the size of a ruler. Um, it swam by very quickly. Hammerheads can be quite shy. Um, but yeah, it's the only one I've ever seen. I'm still waiting to see a big, big um, at all. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if we, I'm waiting to see if Miss Castell's class sends any others in. I know that they have some more questions. Can you hear us? 
Yes. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Jake. Nice and loud. Oh, then awesome. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Wait, what are the first species of sharks discovered? The first species of sharks that were discovered. Yeah, yeah that works. I actually have no idea. <laughs> That's that's a, like, a bit, like, old, like about like over 200 years ago. So <laughs> not really that definitely, it would be probably uh, probably in the 1700s, maybe even the 1600s. I'd have to look it up. Uh, most likely, I would place my pets. It was a species from Europe. Thank you. Go ahead, Madison. What are the most often sharks that you see in the water? Um, depends where you are. So in New Zealand. Um, elephant fish are very common. Uh, we also have another one called spiny dogfish. That's also very common. Um, what else do we have? Uh, they do get white whites quite a bit around New Zealand. Uh, also what we call, they call them bronzies, bronze whaler sharks. Um, so those are the most common ones in New Zealand. Some of the most common. I think we have one more. Oh, oh. Nice and loud. Um, how much? Oh, um, wait. <laughs> Forgot. Oh yeah, Um, what is the average uh, number of species you find each year? Uh, there's a few described every year. Um, couldn't give you a number off the top of my head. It could be up to ten. Uh, depends. Um. There's already been a handful of species discovered this year. Um, sometimes it depends where people are looking. So we find new species in museums. So species that were collected a long time ago um, and either forgotten about or we take another look at them and it turns out that they're new. Um, there's also a lot of research these days that are going on in new areas. So Papua New Guinea is one place where we've never really studied sharks before. Um, so in the last few years, there's a big project going on there now, and they find new species, quite a few new species. Um, so I couldn't give you a number, but there's definitely there's quite a few every single year that we're still discovering. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for all the questions, all the participants, everyone watching, and thank you so much, Britt, for joining us today and sharing all that you did. Continue to join and uh, tune in as we continue uh, Women in Shark Science all week, sponsored with Sharks for Kids and Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon and good morning. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.